All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Robin and Danuta Pfeiffer. We're at Pfeiffer Vineyards. It's May 26th, 2021. Thank you both so much for joining us today, for hosting us. Uh, the first and biggest question to get started, why wine? Oh my goodness. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I taught school for 32 years and four years in South America and 28 years here in Eugene. And uh, I got home one day and there was a message on the phone. Well, this was the family farm. Yeah, this was the family farm. Came here in 1946. And this was in 1982. And they called this number. I called the number and I said, hey, what do you want? This is Robin Pfeiffer. Hey, do you want to sell that land you got to live No, you haven't even heard my offer. Don't care. How about a 30 year lease? No, you haven't even heard my offer. I don't care. Boom. <laughs> Two weeks later, identical call, different person. And I asked everybody I knew, oh, well, who are these guys? Nobody knew. I knew a, a fellow who owned a little wine shop in Eugene. And I was good friends with him because I taught school at Churchill High School with his wife. And I was in there and said, hey, do you know these, happen to know these two guys? Because I had asked 100 people. Nobody knows them. He says, oh, yeah. Oh, my God, I almost snapped my neck. Who are they? Robin, they're the two biggest realtors in the Pacific Northwest who deal exclusively in wine grape growing properties. And I said, oh my God, then I ask around, does anybody know anything about growing wine? A fellow said, a friend of mine said, yep, yeah, my two sons are down at UC Davis studying wine right now, one Enoli, one building. I come out here, I bring them out here, they walk around this property up here for about an hour and a half. They came in, they said, Robin, you gotta go. On a one to 10, this place is a 15. And I said, I'm for not- For Pinot Noir. Yeah, for-, yeah. for and, and I said to them, I said, I'm not even gonna take a little baby step in that direction, because the only thing that we knew about wine, we liked wine and dried ones were called raisins. Really, that's- I well, said, and I, at the time, yeah. at the time, this was a, uh, they were raising sheep. Yeah. So this was a sheep uh, farm and, um, and chickens. So all this time, sheep and chickens. So nothing about growing wine grapes. But what we really raised here with the sheep was the best prime lamb chops in the history of the world for coyotes. You can't fence a coyote out. We drop 175 lambs. We never took more than about 125 to market because the other, they just come and pick one off and run with it. You know? And uh, anyway, these two fellows said, we'll do it. I said, you hang on to this end for the first three or four years. They were good to their word. And that's how we ended up starting. Uh, and those were the Beal brothers. Yeah, yeah. Bruce and, and Brad. Bruce and Brad. Brad became the GM at, uh, at uh, King Estate for 15 years. But uh, it's been, you know, if you ask any winemaker, not, maybe not the owner, but the winemaker at any winery, and that I know of, and I know a lot of my, somebody's gonna say, well, I know one who wouldn't agree with that, but, and they will say, look, they say, all fine wine, all fine wine is made in the vineyard, 90% in the vineyard. As a winemaker, I just bring it home. And so, uh, like a chef, you can't take, if you're the best chef in the history of the world, and I give you a pot roast, you can't make it into a filet mignon, but you can make it into the best pot roast that could be. And this other wine cook chef might make that pot roast into a pot roast that on a one to five. It's a three at best, you know, but this guy makes good. But you can't take the pot roast and you can't take grapes that are a five and make them into a eight, nine or a 10 wine. It just can't be done. The, it's not there. So. So over the course of time, as Robin was, uh, had planted the vineyard, um, and it was one, uh, one segment, one block at a time, um, because he was still going, he was still teaching, and, and planting mm -hmm. grapevines as he could afford them, um, 
one of my favorite stories uh, of, of the early days when, when he was planting this vineyard was that he would come back, come out of school um, from teaching and he'd have a, he'd have a quiver full of little grapevines on his back and he put a white pot at the top of the vineyard with a long string pulled down to the bottom and he waited for the north star to come up and he lined up the white bucket with the north star so that he could get the perfect north-south orientation to the rose. I just, in my mind, that is, I, I keep seeing that visual. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a lovely story. <laughs> I'm going to come back to the vineyard in a second because I have a lot of questions about it. I want to back up for a moment and let's talk about sort of life before wine. So, Danuta, let's start with you. Tell me about growing up, uh, education and career before wine. I was uh, born in England um, and uh, my family right after World War II um, emigrated to um, Canada. My father was a sculptor and a ski instructor and my mother was a nurse. So we had to move quite a lot, depending on my father's, um, uh, what season it was. If it was summer, he would be, if it was summer, he would be um, carving uh, huge statues for churches. Uh, and uh, if it was the winter time, we'd have to move to the ski slopes where he could be a ski pro at one of the, thus I learned to ski at, a, as, at the age of three. Um, and became a, um, a ski pro myself. But um, uh, so we, I went to about 13 different schools before I graduated from high school. We eventually emigrated into Michigan. Um, and from Michigan, uh, my mom and our family, we moved to Alaska, uh, drove to Alaska during the worst snowstorm of the century without snow tires, but that's another story. But from Alaska, I, I graduated from Anchorage West High School there and went into a career in broadcasting. And so for 35 years, I was uh, radio, television, and newspaper um, journalism. Uh, I did progressive radio uh, talk shows, both in San Diego and here in Eugene. Um, and f one little aberration, I became a television evangelist with the 700 Club with Pat Robertson while he was running for president and then realized, uh, well, I came back to my progressive roots, let's just say that, I came back. And um, <laughs> so I so, uh, came back to San Diego. Um, uh, did a 2,000 mile bicycle ride just to clear my head and at the end of that at the end of that ride I uh, decided that I needed a whole new life and a whole new plan and with that plan I came up to Oregon uh, my mom was it was living here at the time as was my brother and stayed here for the summer and uh, while I was here I was writing, because the other thing I do is I'm a writer. I've written five books. But I was writing my memoir, as a matter of fact, chiseled. And while I was writing, I realized that I hadn't been out into Oregon and hadn't seen any part of Oregon. As a writer, you end up being very isolated. So I thought, you know, I need to meet somebody who's going to show me around a little bit. Uh, before I go back to San Diego or wherever I was going to go, I hadn't really had that plan yet. I put an ad in the newspaper and uh, this is this is months before social media and all of that. It was still newspaper personals and I put an ad in the paper that said uh, female 45 conversationalist author um, educated attractive, attractive <laughs> <laughs> loves um, Mozart, Merlot, Cabins, Rivers, and Books, Seeks Mail, 35 to 55, Who Knows How to Spell. And, and I, f <laughs> I figured if, 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 if a man was between 35 and 55 and he knew how to spell, he knew how to read. 
and he, if he was a reader, that meant he was educated. If he was educated, and between 35 and 55, he was probably at the top of his game and we would have something to talk about. <laughs> and um, 13 great Oregonian men answered that ad. And um, Robin was the first one. And when we met on a, on a boat, on a little sailboat on Fern Ridge Lake, he had called the mailbox number and he said any person who can juxtapose skiing, spelling, um, uh, oh, I also said I was a long distance ski instructor, a long distance bicycle rider. He said anybody who can juxtapose all those things in one sentence has to be an interesting person, add sailing to the list and meet me on my, my little sailboat on Fern Ridge Lake, which I did. An hour later, he said, something has happened here. And 11 days later, he proposed, and I said yes. That was 26 years ago. It's pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. Robin, take me through your kind of, your kind of life up to that moment of meeting Benuda. Tell me about, you, you mentioned this is the family farm. Tell me about growing up here and, and getting into education. Uh, we came here in 1946, right after World War II, from Los Angeles. And uh, my parents, four, four children, one infant, and we had a little wood frame house right over here. Now, I don't know whether either one of you know what a Quonset hut is. Do you know what? It's one of those half round corrugated buildings you see on army and on military bases. And those were dime a dozen surplus after World War I. My father bought a small one. It was about, I'm going to say, about uh, oh, 35 feet long and about half that wide. Steel ribs, round door on each end, window on each side. Of, that was it for a brooder house because we had chickens at the time. <clears throat> and before any chickens ever got in there, our little wood frame house burned down. So four kids and two parents moved into this Quonset hut temporarily. My parents were still living in there in 1972. Outdoor toilet, you know, and wood stove and sleeping quarters and then everything else room. Uh, cold as in sin in the wintertime and hot as an oven in the summertime. And, uh, but that was the one where a picture hangs on the wall and it hangs like that, you know. And, uh, but we had probably the best Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, growing up experience around here. And we worked hard. I learned to shear sheep, you know, and all that sort of thing. Hardest, don't ever shear sheep, you know. Uh, you'll, you'll never, anyway. Uh, I learned, and then we started, I started, taught my brother to shear, and then, so we started shearing all these small flocks of sheep around for neighbors. Uh, and, uh, it was, it was hard, hard work because this land here had stumps and everything all over it. We had to clear out, blast them out of the, uh, and then fill in the holes with shovels and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we, as a family, learned what real sweat work was. And not having uh, any money to go out and do anything and, you know, and all that sort of thing. but. Uh, uh, we learned the value of, of uh, what a dollar was and didn't go out and just spend it on stupid stuff, you know, silly stuff, saved it. Uh, and also the value of education. Of, of education and, and uh, I, I'm, I, I was the only one I, somehow I, I liked the outdoors and farm and I don't know if you know what FFA is, Future Farmers, I was the uh, in uh, FFA and learned all those things you do in there and then went to the public speaking state contest and everything like that so and then when I met Danuta I said well what are some of the things that you like to do too and she said well I went to public speaking contests and everything so all of a sudden we had those mutual bonds and and uh, and uh, and then you went to school. And then I went, went on to school. And after I graduated, I had a teaching certificate. And, and, uh, but I thought, I don't know anything 
any more than you know 15,000 other teachers who are looking for a job and I was I had become interested in, in lear learning Spanish and the uh, pre-Columbian cultures of South America the Incas and, and so I said I'm going to go down there for a couple of months and just so I did and I ended up staying for three or four years and teaching down there in, in uh, Peru and Chile and uh, then came back up here and, and started teaching and then had a television show where I taught in Eugene and was broadcast from uh, Channel 9 up on the, up on the hill and uh, for all the schools in Eugene. Uh, and Spanish. In Spanish and then talked about that with Danuta and she said, oh well, I had a show too, I, you know. <laughs> in San Diego, son. so she was the Katie Couric of the West Coast, you know, so all these similar things that came in, <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, it was a little bit cosmic there for a while, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned teaching, teaching a long time, you mentioned Churchill High School. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the kind of progression of teaching for you and, and of eventually balancing that with, with getting, a, getting started here. Okay, sir. Uh, the vineyard part. The well, vineyard part. yeah. Well, I. This is my own personal opinion. I think that uh, uh, teachers who are really interested, not only in their subject, I don't care whether it's math or science or botany or whatever, that uh, besides the subject matter, you become interested in the individuals and the and the kids and. And I could tell, I think within a week or two at the most, I could tell you in my class in the, in the fall after meeting them, I think I could, to a 90% degree of accuracy, tell you who was in kids that were living in a single family home, just because how they were. And, and uh, I became in, in that, in the personal things, besides this teaching Spanish and Latin American studies. And so I decided, and I had an MA in, in teaching at that time, and I took a year's leave and got an MA in counseling and became a, a middle school counselor for eight years. Well, people in middle school, teachers in middle school, call it hormonal purgatory, you know, because they're they're bouncing off the walls and stuff and and I'd walk down the hall and I'd have my my arm on the shoulder could be a boy or and you could tell those, those that were in single family homes they kind of just lean into you you know and and that sort of thing uh, just really touched me and, and got to me and and I and I loved those those years I was there and I knew I was getting closer to to uh, this, as this vineyard increased in the time that it took, I had two full-time jobs, and so I cut down to only being 0 0.6 time mm -hmm. in school, and then even that became, uh, and I uh, wanted to get, get back into high school because that's where I started out, and so I finished up at South Eugene High School my last year, and uh, uh, I. I still miss, you know, a classroom like that. And I thought, God, you know, if they ever, somebody just couldn't make it in, in high school or something here, and they had a class that they needed somebody, I could raise my hand, I, I still have a valid teaching certificate. I could go and fill in for that person for the end of the year, and I would love it. The only problem would be, I probably wouldn't want to leave it again, you know. To, <laughs> but then I fell in love with, with a vineyard and then with, with Danuta and, and, and found out we have even more things that are, are similar to us and bonding to us than, than I ever really even imagined, so. <laughs> so I'm back up to you for a second. You mentioned uh, a, a lot of places, living a lot of places growing up and ending up in Alaska. What made you as a high school graduate in uh, Anchorage want to do broadcasting and what was your first step into broadcasting from from there <laughs> there was a there was a television station in anchorage ktva and the owner of ktva 
wanted to encourage more students to get into television broadcasting. Believe it or not, there was no interest in those days. So, so um, there was a scholarship offered, a uh, $100 scholarship if um, you uh, could audition and then be accepted on the crew uh, and, we, and it was called the Varsity Show. And as high school students, um, we were all juniors and seniors. As high school students, we could uh, learn how to produce a show. And, and, and it was all ours. And so we wrote, directed, produced, did the floor work, worked the cameras, uh, uh, did the hosting, worked on, and it was sort of like Dick Clark, an American bandstand. You're probably too young to remember that, but, but it was a dance show, and we talked about music, and we danced on the show, and um, it was, for me, it was like being hit with a brick. I knew at that I knew at that moment that that was where I wanted my career to go. I wanted to be in journalism. I wanted to be in broadcasting. It was still a new um, it was a new arena, and um, and it just swept me up into its arms. And from that's another thing that Robin and I had in common was he did a varsity show in Chile. <laughs> When, when he was in Latin America, there he was doing almost the same kind of television show. It was like how front page of newspapers. Here's Robin Fife out there going. <laughs> <laughs> so there were so many things that we had in common. It was so unusual. But anyway, um, what are the odds? But but that really took me into. Um, then I went to school at the University of Colorado. Um, and I got my BA there, a double major, one in philosophy and the other one in, in uh, journalism and communication. And you mentioned that the, the book of your career in San Diego. Tell me about the, get, getting to there and, and what, what was the work you were doing uh, for the bulk of your time on television? Um, I, was, I was the, um, well, I, I worked for KFMB TV, a CBS affiliate in San Diego, and there I was. Uh, I was the morning talk show host for a show like Good Morning America. Um, I had a co-host and uh, for five years I was on a show called Sun Up San Diego. And um, it was a very, very popular show. Um, it had been going on for 20 or 30 years mm -hmm. at that time. So um, I was the, the co-host of Sun Up. And then in the afternoon, I was the drive time anchor on KFMB radio. So I was a news anchor in the afternoon. Later on, I became also a columnist for the San Diego Tribune. And I also did a, um, I was a columnist for uh, the Coronado Eagle. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I, and, and then eventually I became a, um, a uh, a social commentator uh, with um, on on the news broadcasts where we had opposing ideas and thoughts, and I was I was the progressive, uh, and then Alan Cranston was the was the opposing thought on. And so, so we would have um, I had a very robust career there, um, and then I uh, tripped into uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, and. Um, Television evangelism. How, how did that happen exactly? That doesn't sound like that, that you were on any kind of path. It like wasn't that. my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. It was. Um, <laughs> I was. I. Uh, I always wanted one of my one of my dreams was to be a foreign correspondent. Um, when I first got into broadcasting, I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I thought that sounded like the adventurous career of, uh, that that um, I really wanted to pursue. So while I'm in San Diego chopping carrots and being and doing uh, recipes and books and <laughs> talking to guests that were coming in and out, just like a Good Morning America show. I still wasn't a foreign correspondent, and then I had um, I had a job offering from some place called CBN, and they said, "Gee, you're uh, you're a very talented uh, woman. We've uh, somebody sent us a tape of your work, 
and um, we would like you to be the um, founder of our um, Israeli um, new news station. We want you to be the news director in Israel and set up the news bureau there. And um, your first, um, your first uh, interview is going to be with the Pope, who was <laughs> traveling <laughs> through the Holy Land at the time. And, and so how could I say no to that? So at the time, I had become a young, born-again Christian. Um, and uh, when I say young, I was, I was into being born again for about two years. Mm -hmm. So I barely knew the the lyrics to, you know, Old Glory. So I, uh, but I took the job. I thought, what a great opportunity to get out there and to be the, you know, the bureau chief of an, well, I drive out to Virginia. I give up my, my jobs in San Diego, drive out to Virginia Beach, Virginia, and um, I'm waiting for my ticket to Jerusalem. And it was on a Wednesday. And they said, oh yes, your ticket will be ready on Monday, the following Monday. So you're going to spend the rest of the week here. We'll put you up in a hotel and we'll give you your ticket to Jerusalem on Monday. So it just so happens that the co-host of the 700 Club had a nervous breakdown. And so she, she suddenly disappeared for the last half of the week. Nobody talked about the nervous breakdown, but that was actually the fact. So they said, oh, Danuta, while you're here, could you just sit in with Pat and Ben for Thursday and Friday and fill in? Um, and we'll give you your ticket to Jerusalem on Monday. And I said, sure. I mean, I television I can do in my sleep. So um, <laughs> I said, sure. I came in. I hadn't really, I had no real good concept about the 700 Club. I you know, Pat, Ben, I didn't, the, you know, Pat Robertson was not somebody that I'd ever met before. Or I, it was just not a big deal to me. Um, I really didn't know the extent of the Christian Broadcasting Network, that it was in 60 countries and, and that more people watched the 700 Club than all the news organizations um, in America combined. It was a huge audience, and it was an amazing um, outreach. I didn't know any of this. All I knew was that Thursday and Friday, I was going to sit in with Pat and Ben Kinchlow, and I was going to interview a few politicians and a few guests, and, and then go have lunch. Well, uh, Monday, I go in to get my ticket to Jerusalem, and uh, I go into the Human Resources Department, it was a big organization. They had 3,000 employees. So I, I go into the uh, human resources division, and there are these little uh, white pieces of paper on everybody's cubicle and on the doors and everything. And it said, please welcome Danuta uh, as our new co-host for the 700 Club. I, well, they never asked me. I was going to Jerusalem, and suddenly, I was now the co-host of an international television evangelistic show. Um, and when you're in that kind of organization, you, you don't really question it because it's the Lord. It was the Lord. It's, you know, the Lord did this and the Lord did that. And who's to question what the Lord, what path the Lord wants you to go on? Well, at the time, I thought it was the Lord. I didn't know it was Pat Robertson. But, um, but I, was kind of, I, I, I was kind of thrown into it. And um, one of the things that I think made me popular on that show, on that program, was um, the fact that I was questioning everything all the time. And they loved the fact, Pat particularly loved the fact that I kept saying, well, why are we doing that? Or what, what does that mean? And how, does, how do we navigate through this? And, um, and I think my naivete and my innocence was um, appealing to the audience because I was learning along with everybody else what was going on here. Um, when Pat Robertson ran for president, 
I pretty much ran for home and came back to San Diego. That is some story. I, I, amazing. I, I'm, I'm curious, as you look back at a, a, a career and it, it, all the forms of journalism you had, are there moments that stand out to you uh, in terms of uh, pr pr prideful moments? Are there moments that you, stories you did or places you went, the people you talked to who you look back on fondly or, or pride? Oh yes, I have very many, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of friends and colleagues from those times that we still keep up with each other. Um, I, uh, there are some very dear people who are uh, very, um, sincere, warm, wonderful uh, friends that I will have forever. Um, it's just that some of those philosophies um, have, uh, I had to, I had to shed. Um, I now very comfortably consider myself a pantheist. Um, God is everywhere, <laughs> in, in everything, and I don't have, you know, he's out there in that vineyard, he, she, it, the, the divine wonderful is uh, in, in the growth of all things. Um, so I've, I've kind of expanded my consciousness quite a bit. Uh, uh, but yes, there are some very dear people back there, and I met some, and I had some wonderful experiences. Even today, we very rarely, I would say if we were walking down a street in Portland or in a department store, somewhere, anywhere, that someone doesn't come up to, you're Danuta. I used to watch you on the, mm -hmm. and when you left, I stopped. And about that time, televangelism has just, I mean, I don't know anybody who says, oh, I watched 700 Club or whatever, you know, re religiously, or n nobody. And, uh, but even today, and one time, we were walking down the beach, <laughs> down by Yahats, it was kind of foggy, and I, we could see this, we had our kind of huddled up, and you know, and with, uh, you know, the windy cold, and he's coming at us from the north. We're kind of walking from the south to, towards. He had this little dog, and he walked past us very slowly. And then we saw that he stopped and turned around. And he said, you're Danuta. <laughs> Do you remember that time? Yeah. And uh, it just, I mean, all the time. We're in a little store in, in Old Town in Florence. And I heard this, oh! Oh, oh, oh. And I thought a mouse or something or run over this lady's foot and I was going to stop it or something. And she's pointing, says, you're Danuta. You're Danuta. And that kind of thing. Uh, uh, I want to tell you three other things that Danuta won't, won't tell you, just real quick. I'm going to start at the top one. Uh, this was about, I don't know, four or five years ago. We went down to... San Diego, and Danuta had written her, the, her book, and she was going down at the, at the invite of a professor at San Diego State to give a talk about her book, and then she gave some, several other talks. But the, the day after we arrived in San Diego, the San Diego Union, the big newspaper now, headlines this big, Danuta's back in town. Just the word Danuta, not but Danuta's back in town, because she was that, uh, oh. when she walked into the room, she filled the room. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and two other things that, that she, won't, she oh, won't mention to you. But when she was 13, she and her mom. Oh, God. Uh, no, not oh, God, let me tell this story. She goes back to England with her parents. She has dual citizenship, so that at that time, and they visit relatives. Well, at that time, the world music and dance craze was, I don't, do you remember the name Chubby Checker? Oh yeah, twist. Chubby, let's do the twist again. Two of the DJs in, in uh, England just got together and they said, let's sponsor the Twist Championship of the British Isles. So they rent Wembley Stadium. That's the Yankee Stadium, you know. 
in, in uh, London. And they stage has got speakers all over and, you know, 20,000 people show up from Ireland and just every place to fill the place. And they've got about 100 people with striped shirts going to tap people out, you know. And so they start, let's do that, and everybody starts twisting, and you get tapped out, and you get tapped out, and everything. Last person standing, the twist champion at 13 years old of the British Isles <laughs> is sitting right here. <laughs> My big claim to fame yeah, there. Yeah. And the other thing she will never tell you about either. Yeah, see, she's still got, even sitting down, you can tell. <laughs> and the other thing that, that she won't tell you is, uh, her junior and senior year at, at the university, she graduated from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And if I say to you, Notre Dame and Alabama, what do you think of first? It's oh, football. You know, well, if you say, uh, the, what do you think of when you talk about Colorado, Colorado State, you, down there, it's skiing, mm -hmm. because those are ski schools. And in addition to the other ones too. But Danuta skied for two years for the University of Colorado women's ski team. And in those two years, she never lost a giant slalom race. And that's when they're coming down, you know, like 90 miles an hour. But that's... Very similar to having skill and twist. You have to... <laughs> th th there you go. Either you got it or you yeah, have yeah. it. Yeah. It's tied together. I, 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 amazing, an amazing panoply of skills there. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Uh, so I want, to, I want to come back to, to here, uh, and, and Robin, you, you, you've, 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 planted, you've started planting the vineyard. Tell me about the process for you. Uh, you grew up working hard, working on a farm, but you hadn't grown grapes before. So tell me about learning learning grapes and wine, and what, what were the biggest kind of obstacles for you getting started? First, let me just interject something. Robin was one of the early pioneers of the South Willamette Valley. Um, there were no other people there were two other vineyards here, and they were they were small vineyards. There were there were no mentors. There was there were there were no vineyards and uh, uh, people knowing what was going on in the wine industry in the Willamette Valley. So, so Robin was one of those early pioneers who had to figure it out himself. Uh, the the first thing. It was a real emotional thing, and. I gotta go back, remember we raise sheep here. And I don't know, do you know what a bummer lamb is? A bummer lamb is, well, if a ewe has triplets, she's only got two, two teats mm -hmm. under. She can only nurse two of those lambs, you gotta take one and raise it on a bottle. Or if something happens to the ewe in giving birth, then you've got two mm -hmm. lambs to take care of. Anyway. After a week or two of having that lamb in a box around you, when that lamb sees you coming, they just, they'll almost just jump right up in your lap. And when that lamb grows up and you finally turn it out, uh, and my dad loved those sheep like that, and those little lambs, they would follow him around, even the big, when he would walk out, that sheep could be up there 150, come running towards him and wouldn't, they wouldn't be any farther than from that when he walked around. And I knew that if we turned this into a vineyard, all the sheep had to go. And uh, that, that was a, I really tugged at myself on that one, knowing that I was going to take away something that was very, very dear to him. Well, he acceded. And when it, he was not an, an angry camper, but he was reluctant. And I'm gonna say this, I say this every time I tell this story. He was very good and he wasn't always just launching torpedoes, you know. And it wasn't until about year five after we had our first fairly large harvest that I showed him a check that I had for I think it was about $6,000 and the largest check I ever saw when we sold lambs was about $2,025. And he looked at that check and I just held it up for him down at, at breakfast. I went down to get the meal. 
and he looked at it, and then he was he was on board. But those first five years, you know, I know he missed those lambs and those and those uh, ewes because he always had his pocket full of stuff to feed him as he went along, you know, like this and everything, and that that got to me. But uh, going into it, uh, I knew about. Uh, I studied soils in FFA, and I knew about soil. I had them all tested up here, and uh, the, all the, the soil was good, and I, and I knew enough about that, and then studying the topography and everything, found out that these two uh, realtors uh, that, that had called, they never came out here, but they, nobody drives around anymore. For, they all study these topographical maps, and you could see the soil types and everything in there, and they knew the elevation. The elevation and the slopes are just very, very important uh, for raising grapes, at least here in the Willamette Valley. And uh, everything was, wasn't just a 10, it was really were 15. And so the more we got into it, and the only thing was that it's very expensive to get into, and nobody in the in the wine grape industry is going to dump off a whole load of posts and wire and everything and then wait for their money. You've got to have it right there or they're not going to unload it because they've been, mm -hmm. you know, short shrift uh, too many times. So anyway, uh, that, was, that was a problem, but I was still teaching full time and doing all this with, so I had a little bit of money to spare. And we did all the work ourselves, in fact. When the grapes did, we all did all the harvest ourselves and all the pruning and everything because we just didn't have any money to pay anybody. Uh, and these two fellows came out and paid, and then we uh, we held back on them a little bit, and they agreed that when we got started getting money, and then we could pay them what they were owed then, and uh, they were real good about that too. And so uh, then we just kept adding a little bit each year as we went along until until now we have uh, uh, 70 acres of uh, wine grapes here and uh, uh, it, uh, when especially in the in the kind of late evening oh when there's only about 10 more minutes before the sun goes down Danuta calls that magic light and it's a different kind of light and it shines up here in the vineyard, and we go out and we stand back out there and look at that until it's finally gone. Mm -hmm. And it does sometimes bring tears to our eyes because it's so pretty, and it's and we look at that and we just, how did we ever do that? You know. <laughs> then we look at our at our winery up here in this room here, and what? How did how did we do that? And, and then our house, and, and we. And we just look at each other and we go, I, I don't know how we did that. <laughs> you know? And there's something. It's a lot uh, of hard work, you know, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah. There's a lot of hard work. Yeah. But did you do an interesting point earlier talking about how you didn't really have a lot of people to learn from in the early days. So I'm curious in mm -hmm. terms of finding great materials and, and figuring out how to plant them and how far apart and equipment, how did you go about learning kind of the basics of grape growing up uh, in your development? These, these two fellows the helped Beals. me. The Beal boys helped, and I did a lot of reading of materials. And you went uh, to seminars. The, the, these seminars by the Wine Grape Growers Association. They were very small because uh, there were there were fewer than a hundred vineyards and wineries combined, you know. And and now there's more like two thousand. But uh, uh, and and they're in almost every county now. Even in Eastern Oregon, they've got some vineyards over there. And uh, uh, but you ask a lot of questions, and no question is too dumb or stupid to ask, you know. And uh, uh, there were uh, a lot of things that people didn't know at that time. And people just you went out, and you took a little cutting of the grape, you stuck it in the in, the, in a pot, and as soon as it had roots and grew, then you could plant that grape out there. Well, uh, it was it was a plant that was on its own roots, and it was subject to all sorts of diseases. And now, just if you go and you want to buy a fruit tree, and I don't care whether it's an apple tree, a cherry tree, or whatever, they're all grafted on a rootstock that is 
that is uh, in, in harmony with the soil and will feed this without being subject to all the pests and everything that are down below the ground. Well, the great pest in doing this was one called phylloxera. And almost any vineyard that was planted, you know, uh, probably before the, the, uh, the 90s, uh, was planted on its own roots. And eventually, you're gonna get phylloxera, and eventually it has to be pulled out, and then you have to replant. And we had to do that here too. And it starts in one place, so you can pull, pull those out in that one section, that one block, and then you're gonna wait for a couple of years, and then this one over here, and so it's, you don't have to eliminate, you know, 70 acres all at once. So it's, but it was still hard to do and hard to pull out because, oh geez, those grapes there were, <coughs> they were really great and, and uh, at the first, at the, at the beginning, you know, well, the one grape that you always heard about in wine, well, God, was Cabernet Sauvignon and well, God, well, we gotta have some Cabernet Sauvignon. So I had planted five acres of Cabernet Sauvignon just because, well, that's a, that's a great wine. Well, <laughs> that's not the great wine. This Willamette Valley doesn't really ripen Cabernet. About every five years, we'd run into a year where it was warm enough, we got a great Cabernet Sauvignon. But the other four, it was, uh, so when that got phylloxera, we didn't replant that, we replanted it back to uh, Pinot Noir. And, the, and then, then you have these different clones of Pinot Noir, you know, and... And, uh, and we, we, so we grow uh, Pinot Gris, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Muscat, and a little block of Merlot. Very small, yeah. At the beginning, was was your plan to make wine, or was your plan simply to grow grapes and, and sell them to someone else? That was our 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 first and goal was just to sell the grapes, and and anybody who's uh, kind of a young and snotty nose and everything like that, you know, well, if you have raspberries or cherries or something out in your backyard, you say, hey, hey, Phil. Let's get together and let's see if we can't turn this in and make some wine in it. So they call it bathtub or garage wine. And so we did that here. And we would uh, we would make a barrel or two just for just for ourselves. And uh, we knew nothing. But we'd ask a lot of questions, get one of these books, you know, written by these guys down there at UC Davis on how to make wine, and you gotta add this and that and all the fermentation stuff and everything. Well, you know, every once in a while, we'd make a wine, we'd say, Jesus, this is really good. So, and we'd enter that into the county fair, and we'd have the judges say, God, we'd get a blue ribbon on it and say, this is the number, you beat out all any of the, the two or three other real wineries. You, you guys ought to make wine. Well, when we'd make those, we'd put a little, we had, all these sheep, you know, and when you mark uh, uh, mark sheep out in the corral, which ones are fat and which ones are ready to, you put a little blue line on there with this chalk on their back, and then you put them through the cutting chute. All the ones with the blue line, they go to market, and all the other ones go back out. Well, we had all this blue chalk left over, so we'd put up, go like that, make a, a blue dot on the, so on the, on the case. On, on, the, on, the, on the box, on the case, when we bottle them. Or on them. the bottle. Yeah, yeah, and we bottle them with one bottle at a time, put the cork in this thing and push it down. And, and after a while, it was a joke around here when we invite people over. They said, well, what kind of wine are we gonna get? Are we gonna get blue dot? And I said, no, you're getting brown dot. You know, or you know, all that kind of thing. But after, when we decided, hey, let's, Let's start a small wine. Not we're not going to make a big wine where we could take all of our grapes, but where we could make, you know, maybe a 500 cases or something like that and sell it. When we came to well, that, we had a basket press. We were doing everything by hand, cranking it down, uh, cranking it getting down, getting the juice in a bucket, pouring it, you know, it and was all that. Everything shoveling the grapes into the basket. Yeah. Um, yeah. It would, oh. Yeah, and if we were there till three in the morning doing that kind of stuff and everything, well, 
uh, when it came time to make our, our premium wine, uh, would you? When it came time? Yeah, to, it, well, we said, well, what are we gonna call our, our premium? And they, everybody else calls it our reserve or our uh, cellar master's choice or not all. Let's call it Blue Dot. And that's, so our top line in any of our wines are called Blue Dot, yeah. <laughs> So when it came time to do that, you mentioned you mentioned kind of the expansion of this place and the addition of buildings and, and yeah. a winery. Tell me about when you decided to build a winery and decided to, to did you did you hire someone to make the wine and, and, and what were you looking for in, in a winery space that you had to create? Uh, the first time we had uh, the fellow across the hill who just started up, he knew a lot more than we did. We said, would you make some wine for us? So he made, I think, four barrels of wine for us. And so that was our, that was our first bottling. Because we really didn't have a facility. We didn't have- We didn't have the press. We didn't, we didn't have, have We didn't squat. have squat, you know, yeah. <laughs> we didn't have anything. So <laughs> then the next year we said, hey, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna have to get into it. So run and take our grapes over there and all this sort of thing. So we said, we're going to just jump into this thing. So we bought a we, press. We still it didn't big know, deal. but we asked a lot of questions about, you know, how how does it how does this press really work, you know, and all that sort of thing. And and the people we bought it from, they came out and showed us how to do all these things. And and uh, we bought a uh, pump. And, that was know, another big deal. And, uh, and you know, and and finally we we had we had a little bit of equipment and we had a couple of um, tanks. Um, and uh, it was it was just uh, we learned as we went along. And as a matter of fact, um, some of the memories that I have of us after harvesting all day long, dead tired, haven't eaten, dehydrated, um, everybody's gone home. Now we have to process the grapes. You you can't wait. You know you're not going to sit on them while the grapes are oxidizing in the in the in the bin so we Robin and I were the ones that were still here at one o'clock in the morning uh, processing the grapes putting it in the distemmer pushing the tanks and trying to finish that so that we could get something to eat and get up four hours later for the next day of harvest yeah. and it was just Robin and me out here uh, Robin is on the forklift and I'm on a ladder mm -hmm. and um, that went on for years. Um, one night I fell, I tripped, it was dark, I slid across a slick sticky floor, the lights had gone out, we were both exhausted and you know pr almost broke a hip, uh, you know thinking maybe I could crawl back down to the house mm -hmm. because Robin was already at the house and he, he was asleep he just fell asleep on the couch and I'm like sliding across the 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 floor up in the you know up here but so it was you know there were times when um, we we came to this realization we need help uh, you know we could use some help um, so it was we it was those baby steps once you had wine, I'm curious about selling it. You, you mentioned it's, it's a, not, not a lot of wineries down here at the time, not, not even now, but especially then. How did you find customers to sell to? What were the, what were the kind of successful ways you moved, you moved wine? <laughs> we, we, we didn't know. Um, we just, uh, we decided early on, first of all, that we were not going to distribute our wines. <coughs> uh, we, it was only going to be direct to consumer uh, because we didn't have enough. To distribute, we didn't. We just didn't have the inventory. We, we still don't. Um, it's all direct to consumer. That you have to come here to get it. Uh, so um, uh, people would come to our house. We didn't have a sign. I don't think we even had signs. We people had heard about us. Friends had heard about us, and they would bring their friends. And we would be. I'd be in my house and Robin would be on the couch watching a duck football game and I would see a car come up the driveway and I would say incoming uh, and then Robin would get off the couch and I'd say get those 
get those socks off the, get the, and I would wipe down the counter and people would walk in and I would say, hi, welcome to Pfeiffer. And they would, and I would serve them the wine. I was even baking bread at the time so that people could have some fresh bread and with a wine. And then if they bought a bottle, I would run into the laundry room and I had a can of spray glue and I would spray the back of a label and stick it on the bottle and come out and we'd sell a bottle of wine. And when the, those people would leave, we'd give it, each other a high five. We sold a bottle of wine. And there were some months when we sold three or four bottles. <laughs> and we were thinking that, you know, that was, that was okay. You know, we, <laughs> that was okay. And, um, but it got, we got to be successful just by word of mouth. The wine spoke for itself. People started walking into our house at all times of the day and night. Some people just wanted to use the bathroom. Uh, so that was when I said, uh-oh, we, we now have to establish some boundaries. We need a tasting room. I mean, we really need a tasting room, but we couldn't afford a tasting room. We couldn't afford to build anything. So we, um, we just took part of this, um, this building, which was the barn for the sheep at one point, and we made a little area inside. It's a little cave-like area, and we, we developed that as our little tasting room, and uh, away we went. And over the years, I know you, you've expanded to have this kind of event space here. So tell, tell us about this space and about what you do uh, indoor-outdoor to bring people here uh, during the, nice, the nicest parts of the year. This is the crush pad. All this fancy stuff gets out of here during September. All of this, I don't get a manicure. Uh -uh. And, and all of these nice pretty things are all swept out, put into storage for the month, and this becomes our crush pad. This is where, this is where the grapes come in, this is where the press is, this is where the distemmer comes in, and this is where the tanks, and uh, this is where it all happens, on this pad. But it never had a cover because we were always in the rain during crush, and Robin one day said, you know, we've, if we can't keep doing this in the middle of, you know, if it's midnight and we're outside, we do have a concrete pad, but we didn't have any covering. So as we started building a roof, I said, how about a fireplace? How about some heaters? How about some windows? How about, how about when we're not using this space that we can use it for people to come and enjoy the wine? And but the first one was just just this covering, and there were no windows. And then all of a sudden, we had this big northern wind. <laughs> it, it was got it rain clear over halfway in. I said that does it. So I put windows. These are these are. Uh, uh, they're not really windows. They're th they're sliding okay. doors. They're well. sliding doors. But, and they were they were on discount. Yeah, we we actually got to At a, a discount, window discount windows. Yeah, but anyway, and they were. Yeah, they just had the right number. And uh, we, and so I put the windows on this. Then we had one that came from the east and blew in this. Damn it! So I <laughs> put them all down this side here, and then we and that over there was all wide open. And then we, so then we closed the whole place in here, and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the water garden, uh, this, that was a great big blackberry patch out there. Big blackberry patch. And uh, Robin and I, at the end of a day, would go out there with two little plastic chairs at the end, and we'd sit on, this is again before we had a cover here, we'd sit at the edge of this crush pad looking towards the east getting a little shade um, and, and having a, a bottle of wine. And I said, boy, wouldn't it be nice that if we could have some place outside where people could actually eat, have, enjoy an outdoors, we could put some chairs out here. And Robin says, you see that blackberry bush out there? There's a stream out there. He says, we could dig a hole and have a pond. 
I said, we could? He goes, you, you know, we could do that. We could, we could dig a hole and it would fill up with water. And, uh, and then we got a guy who dug the hole and Trevor says, geez, he says, you know, I could dig you another hole right at the bottom of that hole. We said, well, it's only dirt. See what that happened. So we ended up having four ponds <laughs> and we got a student from the University of Oregon who had just graduated in landscape design. We were his first job. He helped figure out what to plant out here. And so one night, Robin and I had all these six inch pots, another bottle of wine mm -hmm. and a shovel. And we planted all these trees and bushes ourselves. And that was nine years ago. And now we have a mature water garden where the blackberry bush used to be. I'm noticing a lot of like, wouldn't it be nice if yeah. in the story here uh -huh. so far. Wouldn't it be nice if we had this? And yeah. then suddenly, it, I like that. Yeah. So with the space, with this space and with the outdoor space, now that you have that kind of space to offer, what have you used that for in terms of bringing people here? Friday night burgers and blues. We have, we have live music in the water garden and a tiki bar so people can come out and enjoy that outdoor space. Um, and so we have live music um, in, in the, on Friday nights. Uh, here in the pavilion, we have uh, what I, this is one of my favorite events, it's called Casablanca. And we turn this into a Moroccan nightclub. And we have, we have drapes and we have all these Moroccan, and we have, we have tables, little uh, shishi little table settings, and people can come in here and have a catered sit down five course meal with live jazz um, right, some, and we'd have, we have the film Casablanca being played on monitors and big screens all over the place. It's wonderful. Um, we've had Halloween parties here, birthdays, receptions, weddings, uh, you name it. It has become a, a, a place that we can morph into all sorts of ideas and now with all of our events Mother's Day, Memorial Day, Father's Day, Solstice, winemaker dinners. Uh, uh, we're, yeah, we're exhausted. Keep on entertaining. Yes, well, it is the hospitality industry. That's what we, you know, basically, that's what wine is. It's hospitality. It's just, just call me Rick. <laughs> And Ingrid, and Ingrid. <laughs> but um, but yes, this is the hospitality business of food, wine, and and yeah. celebration. Yeah. So speaking of the wines, uh, you mentioned that from the start they were impressive before you really knew what you were doing in terms of winemaking. Mm -hmm. They were impressive. Tell me, uh, as you've grown and as you've added other varietals, tell me about how the wines have developed and matured, and, and what how you describe the wines you make here now. What what what, what is unique about Pfeiffer <clears throat> wines? For me. Uh, when I uh, sip and taste one of our Pinot Noirs, I can close my eyes and I can feel back way down deep and all I can taste the earth that these grapes grew on. And it's a, it's a very, very soothing, satisfying taste along with the Pinot Noir. And, and it's a sensual experience. I, I don't know how it gets there, but it does. And that's part of fine wine is made in the vineyard and nobody really knows about all. If I had 10 hydroponically grown tomatoes here and one garden grown tomato here and 100 people came in and tasted all of them, They'd say, which one did you like the best? All 100 would say that one. No one would say one of these because they don't have all of the, the minerality and the, and the compounds and the, the things that the soil has that feeds that, that grape and makes the inside of that juice what it is. And there's something about the soil out here uh, that's... Uh, 
that just has all those things in it and you I, I don't know I if you had this is why they say let's say there's a winery down there four or five miles away over there they'll say well if you want to get get it from this one winery out because their Pinot Noir just is, is here and why you don't know but it's it's the soil out there and the weather conditions and the slope and the you know if it was sloping to the, to the north sun's over here you only get half the sunshine you know you know but here it gets all the sunshine when it's all those things like that 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 uh, add to what the what makes the grapes and then, and, and you know and to one of the proof of the pudding is that um, during uh, uh, President Obama's uh, inauguration, our Pinot Noir was chosen for his for his dinner table at the Blair House mm -hmm. the night before his inauguration. That kind of um, set our little world on fire. I can imagine. I can imagine. You know, I, w I was giving a, a talk to the the American Academy of. Uh, of uh, wine educators had their national conference here in Eugene about, I don't know, eight, ten years ago, maybe 15. Anyway, a busload of them uh, came out here, but the, the night before, I was giving a talk to them in some big auditorium, and Danuta's sitting out there in the front audience, and, and during my talk, they said, well, somebody raised their hand and said, well, what makes it, you know, what it is? I said, well, and I went into the soil story, but my wife says that on a full moonlit night in the summertime, she goes up there, takes off her clothes, and walks through the rows, you know. I bless the grapes. I bless the grapes with walking through those. And, and I said, but you know, that's, we don't do it. And Danuta said, well then I won't do that anymore. I said, no, 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 you, you, you keep doing it. Of course, everybody laughed and clapped. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. It's some kind of magic you know, out there. there. There's, you know, exactly what it is. And, and people say that if you have a, a flower that's growing outside and, and every time you walk by it, you say, I hate you, I mean, you know, that flower eventually is going to, it, it understands it just, it doesn't get the loving vibe and but if it and when you walk through your vineyard and drive through or and we go up walk around almost every day to the vineyard the the plants can hear and feel that and is that true or not? I don't do you want to totally nix that and say absolutely not? You wouldn't do that either because nobody really knows, you know. Yeah. You talked earlier about how this is the hospitality industry that, that you're in. I'm yeah. curious, uh, as you've developed a hospitality philosophy over the years, what is it you're trying to give people who come here? What, is, what does hospitality mean to you, and, and what do you hope people get out of coming, out of a visit to this place? Warmth, friendliness, personality, authenticity, um, uh, sincerity, uh, uh, and and a, and a genuine love of nature. Um, when people come here, they they're in the water garden. They hear the birds. They they can walk through the vineyard. They can they can enjoy all the 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 ways that things grow. And and in Oregon, we're very concerned and very conscientious about about how we grow and what we grow and and the and the way we grow and our and our, the, that we don't use pesticides and, and we are good husbands of the, of, of, of the vineyard. In fact, I like to say that we don't manipulate this land. We allow, we allow the wildlife to come in during the winter. We open the gates and let the deer and the elk and the bears and the cougars and the skunks and the foxes and the, and, and every little bit of wildlife Turkeys. come in here. <laughs> and then in the, and then in the spring, we, we close up everything, the, the gates and um, the soil is, is nicely fertilized. And uh, you know, nature has a way of, of responding to that. No, so. I'm going to say everything that Dindu said in one very short sentence. Before we got married, 
on day three or four, I asked and I said, what, what is it that you know, makes you tick and that you would like to do and accomplish in your life? She wrote out 10 things. And one of those things sums up what she just said and is the one that we talked about this two or three nights ago that caught me and this is why 12 days after we met let's let's quit wasting time let's get here's what it was and it was I think it was number to make a difference to make a difference you know and and I think when we have people out here uh, to make a difference, you know, hopefully in their lives. And I think as a result, when we go off, we've done a number of these river cruises in Europe and gone to Tahiti a couple of times and things like that. But every year, a number, you know, six, seven, eight, ten of our wine club members go with us because they become really great friends, and, uh -huh. and uh, we have we've made a lot of friends. And and it's not just the friendship; it's being part of a community. Yeah. We are a very um, we support this community. Um, we're active in the we're active yeah. in the Grange. We're we're the Lions Club. I was president of Seroptimus for a while. We've we've helped keep the the uh, the daffodil festival going for 25 years where I've been the chair of that we've got thousands of people come out for that we're very involved in our community we we are um, first responders we became first responders uh, community responders and then we got um, 12 other people to become community responders we have our staff being trained as uh, CPR and first aid uh, we we are very, very involved in supporting our community. And so it's not just, oh boy, we make great wine, but it's, oh boy, we have a great community. And, um, and that really is, is powerful when you can be a, a, a link to yeah. that community. Well, and it's, it's not just for our gain. No. There are there are a number of uh, of uh, single elderly ladies around, and well, once a month or so, I'll give them each one. Okay, hey, how are you doing? You know, you you need anything up there? And, you know, and they always, well, thank you so much for calling. You know, but um, if you if you don't care about your brothers and sisters and in your community, you know, what are you doing? You know, what what. Why are you here? We well, have yeah, why, mm -hmm. you know. So, but we know, mm -hmm. we know why we're here. So, speaking of that community and of the neighborhood, obviously, many more vineyards and wineries here than there used to be. Uh, tell me about what's changed in the area and, and in, in the Oregon wine industry more, and more generally since you've been a part of it. What are the biggest changes you've seen, and, and what are, what does it look like now versus what it used to look like? What are the biggest differences? <laughs> huge mm -hmm. um, you know having been one of the only vineyards out here now I, I, I think we've lost count how many vineyards have have now populated the area around us um, 15 20 uh, and new vineyards no, we're not talking about we're not talking about wineries but no, we're talking about vineyards, the, 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 and, vineyards and, uh, the, uh, and tasting rooms the, in the uh, original uh, publications that went out that we've seen, used to see anyway, from uh, from these realtors, you know, selling this potential vineyard. Like it's and it's it's near the uh, the uh, what do they call it? The the uh, not famous. Uh, there was another word they used. In I don't there. know. The uh, f they're they're near Pfeiffer. Okay. They're near Pfeiffer vineyards. And so you've got that, you know, and that was a, that was a real, uh, 
And I, and I knew, I found out later that those two realtors, they're the people they were calling for were French interests, you know. To, but, but now there are, um, uh, this, this whole region now is populated with uh, more and more vineyards and wineries and, um, and our association, the South Willamette Winery Association is growing. We've, uh, we've really seen an explosion of, um, of interest in wine and the Willamette Valley. And of course, several years ago, uh, we were, the Willamette Valley was named wine region of the world. I mean, not France, not Burgundy, not Chile, not, not uh, in Australia or Walla Walla. It was the Willamette Valley, our little valley. Um, that was quite an honor. So I want to talk briefly about 2020. Obviously, uh, still still dealing with some of the effects from 2020. But I'm curious, uh, with a place like this where you want to bring people in and have them enjoy your space and enjoy your events, tell me about responding to, to the pandemic last year and, and what kind of pivots you had to make to, to make the year work without kind of the, the usual battery of events you were planning on. Well, I'll talk to the events and I'll let Robin talk to the talk to the viticulture part. Um, we didn't have one. We didn't have an event. We, we, we had to shut down. Um, we had to somehow hold on to our employees because they didn't have a job. We didn't have an income. Uh, so we were using some of our, um, our retirement fund to keep, the, keep our employees, to keep this place going. Um, then we, we got nimble. Uh, as a lot of businesses did. We started doing curbside deliveries. Um, we used our social media platform extensively and, and really developed that. Um, our our daughter-in-law, Isabel, just uh, was wonderful in pulling that all together and, and keeping, our, keeping us visual uh, to the local community. Um, and, um, and then, you know, we, we, we we just held on uh, with our fingernails, but fortunately our wine club members came to the rescue and, and continued to purchase wine from us. Um, instead of having them in, we couldn't have groups, we couldn't have wine club release parties, so we had scavenger hunts outside. So we'd have them come uh, uh, during a whole week instead of just a day, and we'd have them look for their name out in the vineyard, and they loved it. And, and we did drawings and lotteries and all sorts of imaginative ways to keep uh, our connection going. Um, and then we hired um, some, uh, a new crew that came in that, that we hired because we, we lost some employees, obviously. Um, but we have a brand new crew of wonderful uh, people that have now picked up the momentum and um, we're doing better than ever. Uh, but it was, it was hard. It was hard. And then of course, then of course there was the, the vineyard and the, and the smoke issue. Yeah, tell me, tell me about harvest last year, Robin. How, how, how did you handle uh, last September? You know, with the pandemic, and then this whole smoke thing that all of Oregon, even even down south, uh, it was just incredibly hard, tough, demoralizing, mm. uh, and as bad and as terrible as we felt for ourselves. The people, you drive up in the Mackenzie River, Blue River is gone, you know, and all of these homes up there are just, uh, they're, you, all you see is the place where the fireplace was, they're leveled and. You can always find somebody who's had it you worse. You know, I mean, and not just three or four homes, hundreds, hundreds of homes up and, there. And, but here, we had to rely on family and friends to help pick because the, the, the wildfires and the smoke 
came in the week of harvest. It was a, the grapes were beautiful. And it, was, um, and it was that week that the smoke came in. And, uh, and so we didn't have pickers and we didn't have labor and nobody could go out anyway. Yeah, you could barely see 100 yards mm -hmm. here. You, know. and, you and, couldn't see our house from here. Yeah. And uh, some of um, the, the people we sell our grapes to, our contracts were, were, um, <clears throat> our contracts were canceled. So we harvested the entire vineyard on our own, brought the grapes in, uh, processed, filtered, refiltered, reprocessed, refiltered, and um, we actually have a 2020 vintage that's, that we're putting out and we're calling it toast. <laughs> a, a toast to the resilience of, of that vintage. So um, we are, we have made, we have made a, a nice little batch of wine that um, we never thought we'd get out of it. So it has, it has helped. But this year, we're looking, we're looking for a beautiful, a beautiful harvest this year. In addition to that, as, as you look ahead, what, what's in the future for Pfeiffer? And, and, and as, as restrictions start to lift and things start to get back to normal, what are you looking at in terms of future events here? Will they be the same? Will you have changed things? What, what's kind of the future look like for this place? Well, the future looks rosy, actually. Um, I don't think we'll change much because mm -hmm. everything, uh, if we changed and didn't have, like, we still have people go, when are you going to start Burger and Blues? When are you going to start Burger and Blues? Because, you know, it was, it, 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 I mean, we have 100, 150 people. People are just, well, as, I mean, I, I don't have to explain this to anybody on the planet. People are crawling out, ready for a little sunshine, ready for, ready for fun. Um, and, uh, and if you have, and if you can add wine to that, it's, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to be sitting pretty because people are just in, ready to come out and enjoy. And we plan on celebrating with them. Last question for the two of you. Uh, one, I like, one we like to ask couples who work in the industry together. Uh, tell me about the secret to a successful marriage when working together in a, in a business like the wine industry. What, what, what makes it work when you're doing business and, and also uh, life together? And how have you succeeded to this point? Uh, well, we are together all the time, 724, with a business that is 724. But I think what makes it work uh, for us, and part of that answer, would be separation of powers. Um, I am in charge of the tasting room, hospitality, events, uh, decor, that sort of, uh, and, and, and the inside part of this business. Robin, his expertise is in the viticulture, soil, uh, maintaining that vineyard, a and then together, we are the hosts to people who come out during those events. And we also, and Robin is also the pencil pusher. He's a good pencil pusher. He, he's pushing numbers on napkins all the time. <laughs> and so he keeps us afloat. Um, I have big ideas. Robin makes them happen. We also, um, we also have, uh, we collaborate very well together. Uh, we're both we're both um, risk takers, but we're but we are thoughtful risk takers. Uh, we're not reckless, but we are willing to step out and try new things. And uh, we're both gregarious. We both enjoy people, food, wine, and each other. And um, and I and I think the magic between us works. Anything to add to that? Uh, I think that also you, there's a, and I don't mean it to be so sterile, but there's a respect in there, a respect for the person and our values are, are like, like this. 
but what what Danuta does and how she does it and what she says and how she says it uh, uh, draws a a certain amount of just respect for the personhood of the in addition to well she's my wife and lifelong companion and everything and with that with that respect uh, a lot of uh, good things just follow that I think yeah thank you honey <laughs> And you have it on film. Yeah. It's great. It's all on film. It's all the questions that I have for the two of you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here today that we should have covered? Uh, Boy, it was pretty comprehensive. Well, thank you both for your time, for your stories, for your hospitality, mm -hmm. for sharing it with us and uh, sharing it here. Um, and uh, uh, of, all, of all the gin joints, I'm, I'm glad we were here today. So <laughs> thank you both. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. All right. Thank you so much.